Welcome. This is the Free Market Roadshow, probably the largest annual series of public conferences on economics. Remarkable experts are discussing the challenges and providing libertarian solutions to today's problems. Organized by the Austrian Economic Center in cooperation with select th institutes, universities and think tanks, the Free Market Roadshow tours all over Europe. Today, we pay a visit to Zurich. Good afternoon and welcome to Zurich. We all love Switzerland for its beautiful mountains, its wonderful lakes, its delicious chocolate, its tasty cheese and its precious watches. Swiss people love their freedom, their privacy, and we are proud to be an old democracy. My name is Isabel Hers from the Rising Tide Foundation. I would like to say a warm welcome to all of you to this free market roadshow online event hosted here in Zurich. Zurich is also well known for its strong financial industry. The Swiss franc is one of the most stable currencies in the world. Nevertheless, we have to deal as well with global problems of monetary policy, lately also due to the Corona crisis. The European Union is surrounding Switzerland like troubled waters. And for many Europeans, we remain like clear waters of true democracy and solidity. Unfortunately, the EU is shifting away from the principles of austerity, and we hope there is a way to preserve Switzerland from being carried away by this destructive flood. Before we start our great panel, may I introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Lasek Balserovic. Professor Balserovic is a renowned economist, professor at the Warsaw School of Economics, author of Economic Reforms in Post-Communist Poland. In the years of transition, he was deputy prime minister and Minister of Finance in the first non-communist government of Poland. Lasek Balserowicz will gratefully share his thoughts on the costs of continued unconventional monetary policy, which is of great concern also to us in Switzerland. Here is the keynote speech. Thanks again to Professor Balserowicz and to all of you for participating in this exciting online event. Ladies and gentlemen, let me start with a fundamental distinction between the supply side and the demand side of the economy. The supply side is uh, composed by the suppliers, including the producers, and it totally determines the productive capacity of the economy in the long run. Keynes has focused on the short run and has demonized the so-called says law. But there is no doubt whatsoever <clears throat> that in the longer run, it is the supply side of the economy which determines not only the productive potential of the society, but also its purchasing power. And the supply side depends on a country institutional system, including the property rights, extent of economic freedom, the rule of law, etc. Compare, for example, North and South Korea. No amount of monetary stimulation can erase or even mitigate the differences in the productive potential and the purchasing power of the two societies stemming from radical differences in their institutional system. It is therefore an aberration of the mainstream economics. It, ha it has largely neglected the supply side and has focused on the demand side policies. This has been true since uh, at least the interwar period under the influence of Keynes. 
and it uh, has become a fixation since the so-called great financial crisis of the 2007. <clears throat> and this brings me to the issue of the monetary policy of the Federal, Federal Reserve Board, followed by the central banks of other developed countries. This policy, called Unconventional Monetary Policy, UMP, consisted first by, from lowering, by lowering the official interest rates to close to zero, and once it was judged and sufficient stimulation, uh, an unprecedented expansion of the monetary base has been added, so-called quantitative easing, QA. <clears throat> and uh, UMP has been continued until uh, the eruption of the present uh, pandemics, and then it has been intensified. The main issue totally neglected by the mainstream macroeconomics is that the UMP damages the supply side and thus indirectly the demand side. Many economists, even before the great financial crisis, have pointed out that excessively low interest rates induce the booms and then the bust in the asset markets and thus damage the supply side of the economy and the economic growth. Another channel has been discovered in relation to the continued unconventional monetary policy, and namely that it can damage the real economy in a systematic way. I have in mind two kinds of impact. First, the UMP and especially interest rates close to zero induce the zombification of the economy because with extremely low interest rates, the commercial banks have incentives to continue lending to otherwise unviolent incumbent firms. This lowers the allocative efficiency of the economy and thus economic growth. Second, by providing an extremely cheap money to the governments, the quantitative easing and the very low interest rates damage the incentives of the politicians to launch the necessary supply-side reforms. The systematic destructive impact of the uh, unconventional monetary policy on the supply side has been denied so far by the central banks, despite a growing empirical research. What is more, in continuing this policy, the central bank used two doubtful arguments. First, that so-called natural interest rate which is related, as we know, to the work of Vixel, has declined, and that this justified the radical lowering of the official interest rates. Second, that inflation has declined uh, since the great financial crisis over time and below the official targets, and thus the UMP should be continued. Both arguments, as I said, are dubious, if not outright wrong. Regarding the natural rate, it should be remembered that it is a theoretical construct which has various empirical estimations. And the wrong estimations can lead to costly policy mistakes. As it was the case, for example, with the so-called output gap, another theoretical construct which uh, had wrong empirical assessment. Besides, the natural rate 
has been probably lowered, reduced by the negative impact of the unconventional monetary policy on the supply side. With respect to inflation, one should remember that the central banks target the consumer price inflation, the CEP, and largely neglect the inflation of the financial assets, which resulted and is resulting from their own policies and especially the quantitative easing. And the inflation of financial assets contributes to the growing income inequalities and increases the risk of the next financial crisis. Regarding the CPI, CPI it is true that it has been lower since the inception of the great financial crisis and lower than the inflation targets of the central banks. But why? Here we come to the issue which has been strangely neglected by the macroeconomic establishment, that of money supply. Remember that over 90% of the money supply is created by the commercial banks when they grant credits. And this dominating part of the money supply has been growing slower than before the great financial crisis, despite the eruption of the monetary base. This phenomenon has been neglected by the monetary establishment Although I think it largely explains the low CPI so far. I don't have time here to dwell on the reasons for the strange behavior of the money supply. Let me only say that it can be to some extent linked to the side effects of unconventional monetary policy and other policies pursued since 2007. And this is another way how unconventional monetary policy has created the situations which then has been used by the central banks to justify the continuation of this policy. Isn't it a vicious circle? Summing up, the macroeconomic establishment has been conducted or justifying a very dangerous policy. It is up to other people to point out to its uh, fallacies and to propose the alternatives. Thank you very much. Uh, wonderful afternoon. Uh, this is Barbara Kom speaking. We are running the next free market roadshow from Vienna, actually from Zurich, as you know. And our today's topic is the costs of uh, continued unconventional monetary policy, which was discussed by Leszek Bolzorowicz. I have three prestigious and well-known guests from the industry. Um, let me let me introduce Dr. Zundrich. He holds a master um, uh, uh, and a PhD in law from the University of. Vienna. He is an independent financial advisor based in Switzerland and specializes in capital markets, um, wealth management and succession planning uh, with venture capital. Uh, before founding his company, he worked in international finance corporations and a number of global banks. Uh, Zundrich is also a long-standing board member, both of the Austrian Economic Center and the Hayek Institute. And it's not a secret if I tell you that he's also the nephew of Dr. Hayek. Uh, without further ado, uh, Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Kohn. Uh, welcome to Switzerland. I'm speaking to you, of course, in the home office uh, in Zug, uh, also known as the Crypto Valley of uh, Switzerland, with lots of places issuing cryptocurrencies and other cryptos. Uh, I'd like to go to the one of Hayek's hobbies as well, inflation, monetary policy, as mentioned in the keynote, and probably something that Hayek had not imagined, 
the unconventional monetary policy as well as quantitative easing or purchases of uh, assets by central banks. When I was studying economics, some say, uh, something like negative interest rates was unthinkable. There was a point where you know you could you couldn't go any any further down, and now we we had negative interest rates on most government bonds for a very long time, and even after the interest rate on the German Bund has risen from negative 0.75 percent to only negative 0.2 percent as it is today we are still as investors paying the german government when we lend them money again they are borrowing money from the public and are getting paid for it so what are the consequences it's not the government doing this, it's the central banks doing this, and they are flooding the market. On the other hand, they are depressing interest rates. What does that mean for your average investor or the average person just trying to plan for his pension? It means they are getting nothing or negative interest on their savings accounts. Well, if you add in inflation, and the inflation target of the central banks is 2%, which we are likely to achieve this year, if not surpass, that means somebody who leaves his money on a savings account will lose 2% a year. Their money will get less and less. What is the consequence of that? People go out and look for other instruments to invest in, riskier investments, stocks, bonds, uh, uh, with lesser ratings. Uh, they put their money into cryptocurrencies or, uh, and this brings about very wild swings in these markets. That was the boom and the bust cycle that the Austrian economists are famous for and that was also mentioned in the keynote. The idea that Keynes had was that government spending should dampen the bust, slow down the bust. When the public stops spending money, governments should step in and spend money and therefore dampen the bust, slow it down, and bring about a faster turnaround. Well, the central banks have become more and more Keynesian the more the crises have gone on. Every time that a slight downturn, whether in the financial markets or in the public markets, occurs, they print more money to save it. Happened in 2000, happened in 2003, happened in 2007, and now has happened in the COVID crisis. Incredible amounts of money are being printed. What does that lead to? It leads to the misallocation of money. There are now bubbles everywhere. You can argue whether some stocks are overvalued, but just the speed and the amount of which these valuations change is incredible. For about six months, there were a number of uh, American and Asian media stocks that were continually going up. And there was no news on any of these media stocks. They just kept on going up. And in the spirit of what we call momentum investing, if something goes up, you follow the trend. The trend is your friend. And these stocks just kept on going up and going up and going up. 
And then one of these stocks decided, we will make use of our enormously high stock price, which we think as management is much too high, and we will issue new stock. Now, when you issue new stock, you dilute your existing shareholders. And therefore, the stock price came back. It turned out that all of these stocks had been going up because an Asian hedge fund had been buying them with enormous amounts of leverage. And banks had been lending him way more than they would lend any of us, and they didn't know it. They were using asset swaps. So somebody who, according to most sources, had $5 billion, which is a nice amount of money, purchased stocks for over $30 billion. And when one of those bets went against him, the banks that had lent the money sent in a margin call, that is, they asked for increased security on their bets. And everything came crashing down. Goldman Sachs was the first to start selling shares. And all of a sudden, 25 billion disappeared in a matter of days. And what always happens when these bubbles are there, some investor gets caught. In this case, there were a number, of, a number of banks that didn't get out quick enough. And Credit Suisse lost five billion in a week. Now, somebody was not watching. And this is what always happens in these bubble situations. And that is what uh, the Austrian economists have been warning about. These are only the first signs of the bubble beginning to pop. That was a little prick in, in the bubble. Usually the bust will happen in about a year after these first signs that something is going wrong. So our current valuation is justified. Should people jump into markets? Should we watch out? Because the next bubble, when the bubble bursts, it will be much worse than if it had done uh, allowed to deflate in a normal way without central bank in intervention. We will see. And that's so much for my opening statement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. It's been a pleasure to hear you and to hear your comments on the asset bubbles and also a little bit on the zombification. It's now uh, uh, His Serene Highness Prince Michael von uns Liechtenstein's turn. Let me briefly introduce him. Uh, he studied commerce at the Vienna University of Economics and Business and he consolidated his studies by assignments for the banking and industrial sectors in Belgium, Canada and the US. From 1978 to 1987, he worked for Nestle in the fields of controlling, management, marketing, and various markets in Europe and Africa. In 1987, he took over the management of Industrie und Finanzkontor in Vaduz, Liechtenstein, an international advisory and fiduciary trust company, where he now holds the position of president. But most importantly, he's also founder and chairman of Geopolitical Intelligence Service, as well as president of the think tank European Center of Austrian Economics Foundation, based in Vaduz, Liechtenstein. Uh, Your Highness, over to you. Can you hear me? Uh, Barbara, can, can I be heard? I'm, I assume I'm, I just want to, uh, to, to continue where uh, Mr. Zundrich ended and look a bit how did we get in, 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 into this situation? And it was actually, it went for quite a long time. Uh, uh, piece by piece by increased government spending and increased government debt. And governments needed more and more money. We came then through different crises, which the first very clear symptom was uh, the crisis about Greece. 
This was the first one. Then there was the cry, we have to spend a lot of money in order to save Greece, because if Greece falls, Europe will fall, which, which is difficult uh, to see. Uh, in, uh, following that, and uh, different other crises which came of uh, uh, sovereign debt, we gave up in Europe, but the same happened in the US with, with, with the Fed. All rules of a sound and prudent monetary policy. This was um, uh, stopped. We came to lower and lower interest rates down to negative interest rate. We came that uh, central banks basically directly financed uh, so, so, so sovereign debt. As a salvation point, uh, and this are the, the, the facts that we are destroying uh, long term the purchase value of, um, of the savings. We are destroying the savings. We will have a pension problem and we will have a number of other problems from uh, too high services. But it allowed governments to get a higher and higher stake in society and uh, in the economy which is very bad because there are more and more people who financially depend on the system uh, and on this that system than they contribute people who are working in normal in manufacturing in sales in the normal economy in the, in the private uh, economy so the situation can uh, can also be um, can only become worse and i think it was close to unsolvable now there were certain salvation theories coming up like in past one thought uh, and we are smiling about it one can spin gold out of straw the modern monetary theory was introduced which i think one of the few sciences which are really precise is mathematics and according to mathematics it just can't work on the on the long term it can work a very short term and solve it the at the moment, the big white knights for the debt makers are two things. It's climate and panic about climate and COVID. And now under this pretext, another huge amounts of monies are being created. Governments are being bailed out. They can buy as much as, as they can. It brings us also, the, this strong involvement of the state brings us always closer to a plant economy but i think we are also coming by new rules which again either by disease control or by climate control more and more also brings us the plant citizen we have we have to do this and to do that either to avoid pandemia or to avoid the end of humanity and the end of our planet by a uh, uh, a, a climate crash. The bad thing is we are not going into a normal authoritarian system. We are uh, going into a system which is which will be controlled by a quasi benevolent technocratic bureaucracy, which I think is about one of the worst systems we can imagine and will bring us um, uh, down to probably um, a total system of mediocrity and of uh, probably also a decrease of, of, of prosperity. And actually we saw in, in 1989 that the Soviet system and its planned system has broken down. I think it, it is, it is uh, uh, coming back and we now have a, uh, a sort of Marxism with trying to sell itself by humanitarian phase. I think I should stop there, and I don't want to be too negative, but I'm very worried about the trend, and um, I think we have to uh, to keep that in, in our focus. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prince Michael.
Um, I would now like uh, to introduce you to Dr. Karin Wendt, last but not least. I mean, sorry, ladies, last time this uh, today. Uh, Dr. Wendt is an investment banker and has shaped Eastern European strategy at prominent European institutions. She started her career at Deutsche Bank and most recently, recently she was head of extra financial risk management at Unicredit Group. Uh, she's a keynote speaker at A Speaker. She's a senior a serial entrepreneur and a research and editor of sustainable finance. She advises companies on digital transformation and she was named investment banker of the year in 2020 by prestige awards. She developed an enhanced rating system and was responsible for its Im implementation in two major banks. Her new book, The Fourth Industrial Revolution and its Impacts on Ethics, has just been published by Springer, Palgrave and Macmillan. Uh, Karin, we are looking forward to hearing from you. Yeah, I think a lot has already been said. So we are in, a, in an age of disruption. We see financial disruption. Uh, uh, central banks are uh, flooding the markets with money. We see an interest rate uh, converging to zero, so it has lost entirely its steering function to distinguish between good and bad investments. And uh, the flooding also has led to financialization, so only 10% of the money which is uh, um, available goes to um, um, the physical, to physical products uh, and 90% uh, go to um, swaps, colors, um, securitization vehicles. So whether that's a, a sound or good balance, uh, that's anybody's guess. Um, we also see um, technical disruption. We have uh, now a blockchain. We have the fourth industrial revolution uh, where it is, uh, it is very important that uh, you have a digital business model and um, the blockchain allows peer-to-peer -peer lending and a different uh, yeah, way of uh, financing uh, new and innovative uh, products and, and companies. And we see also social disruption, so all the sharing economy models and the platforming, which means uh, that it's not important, according to Silicon Valley, for many companies to have uh, profits, but uh, to have a burn rate. So how quickly can you burn money to, be, uh, to become the first and the biggest company or the biggest platform uh, that can dominate the market in the technical age. And then we see um, governance disruption. And this is, uh, well, the case also when we talk about climate change, this is when we talk about COVID. So we see uh, a model where we have um, the United Nations or other international organizations uh, that create a standard which is voluntary. And in the second step, there is a private partner like the banks or um, yeah, the industry who uh, declares that standard mandatory. So for instance, in finance, we have that with the World Bank where uh, they were creating their IFC performance standards, their environmental and social governance. It was voluntary. All um, member states signed and endorsed the standards and then the banks came and made it mandatory. And this is a model which we are seeing quite a lot at the moment. So uh, if we summarize, what that, does that mean? So we seem to be heading into a situation where we see uh, much more uh, intervention of the state, of uh, international institutions with their governance models, which in one way or the other are made mandatory for um, yeah for the population or even yeah for companies and uh, we see helicopter money and uh, this is a really a situation where um, yeah innovation uh, yeah is just uh, squeezed and uh, so we would need to redirect money really urgently to innovation 
and see more entrepreneurship. And also, this applies also for sustainability. Um, so that we have uh, a model uh, where, where money is really invested on the ground, on this planet, not in financialization, for innovation, for good ideas. And um, we often apply this five or six capital model uh, because we don't have only financial capital, we also have social capital, we have cultural capital to lose. And I think uh, if you look into the current COVID situation, it's uh, we're clearly losing not only economic capital, we're also losing social capital, we're losing cultural capital, we're losing a lot of kinds of capitals and this is something which we really have to turn around with entrepreneurship and this uh, can be a different conceptualization of sustainability. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Karen, for covering uh, this very important ground on, 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 on capital, all kinds of capital and, and resources that we are losing right now and that are being destroyed by the current crisis. Um, I have the first questions here from the floor. And by the way, you can always uh, look up uh, freemarketroadshow.com events, uh, free market road, uh, Zurich. And of course, you can have this live and via our YouTube and um, Facebook links. Um, the question is the following. What is your opinion on creating alternative structures based on crypto economic principles and systems to ensure that people can preserve wealth while minimizing government interference? Question is asked by Martin and uh, I'll hand it over to you first, Karen. And if the gentlemen want to add up uh, add on, feel free to do so. So let, let me start like this. Competition is always good. So if we have no alternative, if we're just uh, at the mercy of the central banks, that might not be a good idea. So central bank money is fine as long as we do have an alternative. And crypto finance or cryptocurrencies could be an alternative and, and they cannot be steered by the government. So that might be a, um, a, an opportunity to... Um, to steer money to um, the real economy and uh, to finance new innovative ideas. And it might also help to prevent wealth in a situation where, well, if we look where we are, what happened is um, that the central banks are buying bonds, they are buying ETFs, they might might, might start to buy um, even, even shares. So the money has to go somewhere. And, uh, well, Japan is a good example for that. What it means finally is that we have uh, the companies owned by the state and uh, this might not be a situation we all want to see. So I think we have to think about alternatives and cryptocurrencies might be one. Um, do the gentlemen want to add on that? Well, I Michael? think that it would be a good additional uh, way like uh, how actually all the new and innovative um, businesses can finance themselves a bit mm -hmm. in, in a sort of a parallel system which is not mm -hmm. the black market system or gray market system it's, it's a legal system, system but it's but probably it's more efficient more and more targeted, and more targeted than, than, than what we do through so the so traditional the banking and central banking, banking system. And banking so I think it can be so very it helpful. Can be very helpful. Um, uh, of course, alternatives are are always good. However, one of the one of the claims on the crypto side is always the uh, decentralization and independence from from governments. Mm -hmm. But it might also be an Achilles heel, as in sixty five percent of of Bitcoin being mined in in China, and they literally have the means to pull the plug uh, on those operations, as in physically walk in there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. and on the Western side, of course, you have the possibility to regulate cryptocurrencies. So total independence from governments is probably not there. Well, that's absolutely well, that's true. Absolutely true. But if you see where you see where, where, where these where, giant, where, where, a lot of Chinese companies, Chinese companies will be headquartered, will be headquartered. So, they, so they they 
they create, they create a uh, holding company for Switzerland. Well, Switzerland was well, very Switzerland prominent was very at the very beginning, the very beginning with cryptos, with and, cryptos and there is a city called Souk that, that was uh, literally supporting literally one of supporting one of those. One you could even pay your taxes in in Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Um, um, but I can, not many other many to. countries in Europe have followed. Uh, at least not until now, even though the European Central Bank is working on a digital euro and the Swedish Reichsbank is working on, uh, on a digital krona and many others. So what is your, how, how long will this, um, will this uh, development last until we have uh, competition mm -hmm. among the cryptos and other... So. I think so. The, the situation, the real danger is the following, according to my analysis. Uh, so uh, when we have the digital currency, what you do have is programmable money. You can tell people uh, you can use it for this purpose, but not for a different one. Of course, with crypto, you can do exactly the same. Uh, but uh, there's a difference between a distributed ledger and uh, very different interests within the crypto community and the state or a central bank uh, who can, um, yeah, idiosyncratically decide where you spend money on. And we see it with the Chinese, with the Chinese uh, digital currency, with the uh, Chinese digital yuan. Uh, what we see is um, they um, there's an expiry date now on money. I mean, this is a great tool maybe to, to um, to fight inflation, to increase demand, if you put a, an expiry date uh, on money, but I don't think that savers will like it. So there's no, I would say, no uh, incentive to save money then. So Richard pointed out the asset bubbles that we that we have seen. So what are the true values? Where would, I, and this question goes to all the three of you, um, where would you invest? Maybe, Michael, you want to start? Well, I think I really uh, like to, uh, actually, I, I, I quite like to invest in operational businesses, which I'm running myself, or I know very well what, what, what it goes. I also believe in certain things like in, in forestry, agriculture. I think I, I like the, 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 the real business. But I think we have also for that, we have to, uh, to look at, at efficient ways of um, financing it. But mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm not a big fan today of the financial markets. <laughs> Well, um, so the real economy is your is your favorite tangible yeah. goods and products, um, right. Richard. Tangible companies on the financial markets. Uh, I I tell my clients, of course, to diversify as as far as possible because not everybody has the uh, the possibility. So real assets, uh, real, est real estate, agricultural fund, and so on, things they are not making more of, uh, obviously gold, uh, you, you can have crypto, everybody has to decide on their own mix, but a real company or a share in a real company, uh, as long as that company does not go bankrupt, it does not matter whether one share of Nestle is uh, one franc, a hundred francs, a hundred million francs, as long as I re retain my property right to have one share of Nestle. So that, that can't be uh, inflated away, unless, of course, the company, the underlying company go bankrupt due to uh, intervention situations or the cessation of their business so if you're trying to ward off inflation that's coming diversify karen last word yeah so where do i invest so the first thing is uh, real economy real economy real economy and that this can be shares traded at the stock exchange why not 
maybe one third. But I also would put uh, two thirds, uh, that's my philosophy, in uncorrelated beta. And uncorrelated beta would be, um, yeah, um, land, um, agriculture, uh, so all these alternative assets which do not move up and down with uh, the share prices. And uh, w we can also talk about uh, gold, silver, um, and, and of course cryptocurrencies or paintings as uh, they create this uncorrelated better. But don't invest it into financialization. No ETFs. And um, yeah, hedge funds. Yeah, I'm well, not such a fan from fan of. So I would <laughs> well, really I, I... go very traditional and and see that I have a good mixture and a lot of uncorrelated better and and shares. Yeah. Well, th thank you very much, Karen. Thank you very much, uh, Richard and, and Michael. I think this was very important for our audience um, and to, to, and to, to hear uh, where one could go, especially given that this was the Zurich, the Swiss Free Market Roadshow. We are very traditional, uh, very conservative on that, but I'm sure we will have further discussions on whether it's modern monetary theory or whether one should invest in, in alternatives um, without uh, giving you more hints on that, I would simply like to thank you once again, thank the audience for their questions and thank uh, you as speakers, distinguished speakers, uh, thank you for joining. And I'm just announcing the next session which will take place tomorrow at 5 o'clock p.m. again. Uh, it's the Viennese second edition Free Market Roadshow of this year. And as I mentioned already, we will discuss tax policies post-COVID. So thank mm -hmm. you again for joining. Looking forward to seeing you again. Thank you, uh, lady and gentlemen, for joining us. Have a great evening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye.